Thank you very much. This was interesting, and uh, we're going to stay in that area with the next panel. And while the panelists are taking their place, I'd like to introduce the topic of the day, Connected TV in Europe, the future center of home applications. Um, so we're looking at a bit of a different perspective at the market. And I'd like to introduce the panelists. We've got in the corner right next to you, Dirk Wittenberg, chairman of Relax TV. Welcome, Dirk. Applause for Dirk. In the middle, we've got Albert Jan Tebe, director advanced advertising at Liberty Global. Welcome, Albert. And then sitting right next to me while I'm joining you is Rannik Jamke, head of OTT at One Football. Welcome, Yannick. You're based in Berlin, Yannick. So this is I a am. home game for you, isn't it? Ten minutes door to door. So walking or by bike? No, by train. So by train. Okay. So this is probably the closest you can get to this conference, and uh, very convenient for you, of course. Um, so we're all familiar with Berlin. We're here. We're familiar with IFA and the conference, but maybe not everyone is familiar with One Football. Um, maybe you can just quickly explain to us what the platform is and how you're, you know, connected to this smart TV world. Absolutely, a pleasure. So thanks for, for having me. Um, so we self-describe us often as a global digital football media platform. And if you decompose those couple of fancy words, it's we are globally available, so truly a global player. Yes, we do have core markets, but our ambition is to um, operate globally, serve locally, and this in particular with CTV can be a challenge. <laughs> um, then um, football, so we are a vertical platform, so we don't try to be everything to everybody, uh, like other platforms, Facebook, YouTube, who have to serve like a bunch of different genres, like fashion, sports, music. We are one thing and one thing only, uh, which is football, and ultimately a platform. And uh, I often feel like many, many companies say they are a platform, but I think we are really one where we are a platform for all content creators in the football media ecosystem, whether these are blogs who are writing about football, club leagues federations who have also content, or, uh, and this content creator group is super relevant for Connected TV and the reason why we extended uh, our platform to Connected TV, because we have been inherently mobile first, is uh, football broadcasters. And all of those content creators seek an audience, have content seeking an audience, and ideally also monetization. And that is where we come in, trying to connect supply and demand in the football uh, media ecosystem. So it's, to summarize that, it's a free platform, advertising financed? The core business is free ad supported. We have one direct to consumer business on top of this free media platform, which is OTT, so that we also have paid pay TV broadcasters on the platform who sell their products uh, on, on one football. Okay, and I access you via an app. So, um, as said, uh, traditionally mobile first, uh, iOS and Android. Um, we have a website which mirrors the experience. And then after we started to onboard football broadcasters as content creators, seeking an audience and seeking monetization, um, getting to the big screen uh, was uh, yeah, a requirement, just f even if just for convenience purposes for the end consumer. And this was one and a half years ago, where we then also extended from mobile to web and ultimately to mm -hmm. connected TV. That means that on connected TV, it's only a sliver of our overall offering because it's uh, the OTT video product that is available on the CTV, while on the mobile apps, you have all the different blogs, articles, stats, and so on. So it's the OTT video product that is available on the One Football TV app. Okay, thank you for these insights. Albert, we don't need to introduce Liberty Global, being one of the big legacy operators. But I'm going to ask you a similar question I did with Frank over <laughs> this morning at Vodafone. So what do you consider yourself at Liberty? Is it like you're a cable operator, a telco, or a platform provider, or a bit of both? Well, uh, I think these days we call ourselves uh, a telco business. Uh, I think over the years we, we transitioned from a classical cable operator with TV and, and broadband uh, internet. We transitioned into... Uh, 
uh, a telco offering, a fixed uh, telephony, uh, mobile telephony. We ourselves call it uh, first mobile convergence strategy. Uh, I think earlier uh, today you called it quad play. Uh, that's yeah. basically what it is. We, we believe in, in bundles of similar sort of products and services. Uh, makes it easy for people, you know, they, they just have one stop shop and they can get everything uh, related to, uh, you know, connectivity and, uh, and entertainment. Okay. Um, now, Dirk, for those of you who haven't been here this morning, maybe a just a very quick word on Relax TV and the two footholds you've got in the market um, with Relax and Foxum and the acquisition bit. Maybe a bit more on that because we didn't really touch that this morning. So what's the new big company behind you? Well, I mean, as, as you said, Foxom Relax. Foxom is an operating system for connected TVs, and Relax is an A-board fast service. And um, as we discussed before, we just completed a merger with a company uh, headquartered in Singapore called Season. And we have basically a combination of an operating system for connected TVs and an a -word fast service, which runs on our own operating system, but also is present on Google TV, on Samsung TV, on LG TV, and all the big platforms. So in all these different platforms with the Relax TV, but in the ideal combination from your point of view, of course, you're on your own OS. <laughs> Can you repeat, please? And so in the ideal situation, your Relax TV being offered on your own OS, which is for Well, that's the ideal, because at the end, it's about, you know, who, who, where's the viewing time going? And certainly we try on the own operating system to get viewers into Relax and have it deeply integrated in the platform. Yeah, so is your strategy comparable with the, the one from TiVo? because they also have a UI, UX. Uh, well, if TiVo is a UI mainly, yeah. um, and there's a lot more to do in the operating system when you want to make a kind of TV that has linear broadcast as a component, so it's a really a deep integrated um, operating system, more comparable to Google TV. Ah, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's focus on the CTV market, the connected TV market. Um, Yannick, you've just been touching a bit that you are now from the mobile world entering the big screen world the connected TVs. Um, how can I imagine that when I want to access one football? Are you on all the different platforms now? We've just heard this morning it's a very complex world with lots of platforms and lots of players. And what progress have you made so far? So what TV set do I need to, or what OS operating system do I need to access one football, your app? Um, what's your market position at the moment? So I would say, or I would describe us as rather accessible for the end consumer. So yes, the connected TV space is not as consolidated as we see it on mobile. I think mm. everybody knows. But also on connected TV, I think with a couple of operating systems, you can get a far way. So it's like this 80-20. It um, will be super hard to squeeze out the last 20% of availability, because then you get in a bunch of long tail operating systems. But how we approached it was, we looked at our um, core markets, we looked at our install base on mobile, so where are the monthly active one football users, and then we looked at where do we have broadcaster relationships. I mean, for sure, Germany, the zone is selling pay-per-views on one football, Sky is selling pay-per-views on one football, Magenta Sport does, Sport Digital. So in Germany, it's rather among the football broadcasters who is not on one football instead of who is. So yes, in Germany, we must be absolutely properly penetrated uh, and easily accessible. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at saying Brazil is important for us, Italy is important for us, but bottom line, we um, decided to go with fünf, uh, with five global operating systems, um, so Fire TV, uh, Android TV, LG, Samsung, and um, TVOS. Mm -hmm. and, um, no RDK? No, because the point is that since we are a global company, we needed to maximize technical reach from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I know that before I'm now looking into a sixth operating system, I'm engaging now with local telcos, because, okay, Germany, Italy, Brazil are core markets. The most value I'm getting is to now we have covered a global base with yeah. those five operating systems. Yeah, first, you need to build scale, basically. It's technical reach, yeah. which uh, you can faster establish with op uh, working together with those global operating systems. But now, I mean, there's no way around like those local takeos who have still like huge uh, customer bases you want to access. So meaning, in Brazil, you engage with the Claro. 
Mm -hmm. In Italy, you engage with the TIM, in Germany, with the Magenta TV. But uh, I think those five that I mentioned and where we are available give you a good base uh, globally. Mm -hmm. um, and sure, if US would be a core market, which it is not, there's no way around Roku. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say the other five are rather straightforward and get you like to 80%. Then let's talk about the other 20% uh, down the line. Mm -hmm. Now we've just touched a couple of things that I'd like to address uh, in the next question. And that's for you, Albert, because coming from the telco side of things, we had the same with Vodafone this morning. Of course, you want to attract people to your platform. Um, so that's Horizon in the Liberty uh, world, and that's still set-top box based. Yeah. So exactly. then there comes, we've already mentioned Samsung and LGs and um, Philips and all these other players and say like, no, 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 we've got the smart TV platform. This is the platform where you can get all the apps, including one football and so on. Um, so where do you see a telco in, in, in on that battleground, really, with Liberty being, well, you're trying to sell your own box, but on the other hand, there's the smart TV platform kind of in the middle. Yeah, well, it's an interesting uh, uh, situation we're currently in, uh, you know, with the uh, the ever-growing uh, operating systems on, on the smart TV becoming more and more mature, uh, which is very important, obviously. I think what we uh, still bring to the table uh, to our customers is, uh, and obviously we have a long-term uh, relationship with them, a trusted relationship as a content provider. And um, I think we, we, we not only bring TV services, we bring a whole suite of services, you know, uh, mobile telephony, broadband internet, so people have a one-stop shop to go. But then again, you know, people could choose to uh, just ignore us for the, the entertainment service and then go directly to, this, to their smart TV, to their Samsung or LG or any other smart TV, because they are providing the same. Uh, but I think that's not the case currently. Uh, I think we, we provide the whole suite of linear channels, uh, catch-up TV on the linear channels, obviously recording capabilities, and on top of that, the, the apps and, and even fast channels. Uh, we are actually actively uh, in some markets trying to integrate fast channels into the EPG. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a bit of a business model because uh, we can, uh, you know, we can ask some money, like Samsung is doing to get a top spot in, the, in their EPG. That's how it works. Uh, but because we provide the whole bundle and uh, high quality content, that's basically the key thing for, for customers. And uh, they know how to find us. You know, they know us for many, many years. So as long as our services are high quality and the UI UX is uh, top notch, then uh, I think we still have a place in the market. So there's still a need for a set-top box. Yeah, it's yeah, and it becomes smaller and smaller, <coughs> by the way. Okay. Our latest set-top box is, uh, is just like a big uh, matchbo matchbox. You can just stick it behind your TV. It's all IP. Like a dongle, more or less. Yeah, it's more or less uh, almost like a dongle, okay. yeah, yeah. So is that the latest generation then of the Horizon, or is that? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, What's UI, UX wise, it's more or less the same, yeah. although we have some different flavors. Okay. Uh, but obviously the size and also the sustainability is, uh, is yeah, the latest, greatest. Okay, Dirk, you Well, it's say. quite interesting what you were saying, because we have actually competitors now in the living room uh, compared to the good old they days. We have two competitors yeah. on the yeah. stage. The good I old days was like the set box, and you controlled what is available in the living room. The TV didn't have any control about content delivery, and now suddenly the TV is competing with the set box, and that makes it interesting. So that means yeah. the whole market is a bit like, you know, in a race. Um, who gets more control in the living room? And um, I think this whole connected TV changed the total landscape. The operators are thinking about well, like how to gain back control. That's what you see when Sky made their own TV. They now try to make their own TV to push out yep. Samsung. It's a bold, bold and step, that's actually. Battle. You know, it's about yeah. you know, winning the gateway. And yeah. whoever has the gateway controls what the viewer is watching. Yeah. That's where the money is being made in the future. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I actually yeah. think we underestimate like how big of a gatekeeper function the uh, STPs or the setup boxes still have because you had in the past like the entire customer base installed. Mm -hmm. And this is a major competitive advantage. And there's a reason why, instead of now as a one football, we are de de developing for the sixth um, operating system. No, we engage with those guys. I mean, depending on local relevancy. But then uh, Magenta TV in Germany, uh, Tim in Italy, 
is more relevant to be locally relevant to access a local customer base than to be on uh, Visio or wherever. So I think we should not underestimate like how much of a gatekeeper function often um, like the traditional TV operators still have in order to access just um, yeah. customer bases. It also depends on your viewing behavior, obviously. You know, uh, many young people hardly watch any linear television. So is there any uh, uh, added value for them to have a cable subscription? I don't know. Maybe for them the, the smart TV is good enough because they can just access all the, the apps straight away. It's probably a demographic question where I think like the yeah. younger audience just uses all these app streaming services. They're not even used to linear TV anymore except for big entertainment events, breaking news or sports coverage. And then again, you've got the older demographics that just want to turn on the television set, watch linear TV, and then from time to time, the most they do is watch catch-up TV, which is still linear TV, but on demand. So it's probably a question of the age then, really. Do you still watch linear TV, Yannick, being from the young generation? I mean, for me, it's more like a difference between technology and format, because, mm -hmm. I mean, there is linear correlation on, on streaming, right? It's like... 24-7 linear feed, whether it's a fast channel or whatever. Um, so I think it's more like the uh, technology gap mm. that, okay, you have quote-unquote traditional linear t uh, TV, satellite cable, terrestrial, whatever, and then you have like um, IP-based streaming. So I think there's a difference between in the technologies, what technology is adapted in which demographics, but the product can be the same. I can serve uh, linear television via streaming so streaming TV, um, but um, yes, there is more like, okay, please, at my own terms, mm. when I want to consume content, I can say I'm a huge uh, catch-up viewer. Um, when I have time, then we just expect uh, television is programmed as such that we can access, but I'm always a bit um, surprised in terms of ultimately it's a technology to deliver a product uh, and I think both for the technology, there are differences between demographics, but also when it comes to the product, the content, there are different habits and preferences between um, demographics. In the end, it's really the content that people are interested in. I think not so much the technology. Technology is just there for the content to be delivered in a proper way and uh, in an ideally easily to be accessed way. Um, so it's brands, it's content, originals, exclusive uh, content that's probably drawing the audiences. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be monetized. We have to make money with the content, and it's a commercial business. And so um, a question for you, Albert, because something we haven't touched yet is addressable TV, targeted advertising, because when you compare linear TV and the CTV opportunities, there is, I think, a great um, chance for marketing um, content in a new way, AWOT, fast channels. Um, do you think that that is a growing market and what does Liberty offer in that area? Uh, CTV and fast channels are definitely a growing market with a huge potential. I think depending on the area, it's, it's not very significant yet in Europe, at least. You know, in, in the US it's big. Uh, in Europe it's starting to grow and grow, but uh, I don't think it has the necessary skill to, uh, you know, to generate the the big revenues that uh, the you know the, the traditional broadcasters generate. So from that perspective, there's a lot to do. Uh, there is still uh, s there are some challenges with uh, the the targeting and how to fill the ad breaks. There are some questions around how good the uh, measurement is. Uh, I know from from uh, personal comments from uh, from Unilever, for example. Uh, and and that's because they are comparing things with linear TV with online uh, and it's really difficult to, uh, to to match those two uh, there's always this, uh, this, uh, this this big goal to have just one audience and reach them uh, on many different channels which makes sense obviously but then again in reality the budgets are divided there's a TV budget there's an online budget and then you get a new budget which is called addressable TV which mostly comes from the TV budget but because it's targeted, you can actually already start with a small budget for a campaign. It becomes uh, it, it becomes uh, attractive for smaller niche advertisers. Yeah. So there's, there's there's a lot going on, and um, so a huge potential for CTV, but it it needs a bit 
bigger scale, I think, and then some uh, some some improvements in in targeting and maybe measurement. But you you could debate about it, you know, because people are also have a fixed budget for for online and don't care about TV. So the 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 wish to deduplicate the audiences is not always really necessary. It's nice to have, and maybe for some advertisers it's a must-have. But but still, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a blocker. Uh, and in terms of addressability, what we're doing is we basically make the linear TV and some uh, related areas as replay and recordings, we make it more targetable. Mm. So rather than uh, depending on the, the local uh, bodies like uh, BARP in the UK, SKO in the Netherlands, we add extra data to the mix, audience data, uh, allowing for far granular targeting and that obviously creates more value and uh, helps the broadcasters to bring them a bit more on par with uh, the online uh, platforms and uh, it's creating uh, additional revenues. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see that it can even, addressable TV can even open up new um, companies that wouldn't have thought about ever advertising on television because you know, there's too many people reach that they don't interested in with their product or maybe it's just a regional service that they're offering or niche product, but then there's with, adver with targeted advertising the opportunity to reach a small audience, but an audience they can afford to reach, even though it's classic television. Yeah, and yeah, I think that the, the, one of the big added values of addressable TV is the big screen. You know, the big screen is a lean back experience, has, has, a, has a huge branding value compared to, uh, you know, your mobile phone or your, your laptop. And, and I think Yannick. we are touching here on two critical challenges that addressable uh, TV still has. One is just critical mass. I mm. think it's still lacking, and especially for a consumer uh, goods uh, company like Unilever, they, they need to reach millions. It's fine that I can highly target a niche, but that's not what they're interested in. So I think we are still in the process of migrating audiences from uh, linear television to um, digital. And I think the second challenge is a bit of, I think digital video still has this lower quality, lower quality inventory kind of notion mm. compared to television, premium television mm. and so on. And I think maybe we get uh, later into this, but I find it super interesting or like which role sports can play to reframe digital video a bit to a more premium inventory, television inventory, because you said there are different budgets, uh, digital video, mm -hmm. which mostly is associated with semi-professional content on YouTube, and then premium content that has been historically <coughs> on linear television, but um, now you see exclusively sports content on Prime Video and so on, or on YouTube which can like from an advertiser point of view also reframe that this is premium inventory that is available on, on digital. So both <coughs> scale and then with digital video versus uh, digital TV inventory, yeah. premium versus low quality inventory. I think that's, that's one of the other advantages of, uh, of addressable uh, advertising, which is usually on traditional linear channels. So the, the brands like uh, ZDF, for example, or Channel 4 or Sky in the, in the UK, they provide high quality content and also brand safe content. Mm. So I think someone mentioned today, uh, uh, if you have a strong brand name, you know, like Netflix or like Sky, then uh, this obviously helps a lot to, to sell the, the video content. And maybe yeah. let me also add one aspect, which always ties in nicely to addressable. The, the big advantage of a fast or like IP-based television is we can break up channels into smaller pieces. So it means what you think uh, like addressable, where we can make the basket smaller. When you look at traditional TV, when you have a satellite distribution, you know, you decide about a $1 million investment. If you make a second channel, it's a second million dollar. When we have a fast channel and I break it up in two, my investment is zero. Yeah. It's a matter of hours. So it means you can package the content already into a kind of smaller program, which is much, much sharper addressing a, s a specific audience. So I think there's a double effect you can measure, but you can also program around a specific target group without the extra cost you had in traditional TV. And that makes it so attractive for the advertisement world. Yeah. I think in the future, if, if, there, is a, if there is a big scale for fast channels, 
I see a lot of potential in uh, making the, the channels uh, customized. So basically, uh, use uh, content recommendation, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, algorithms to make it personalized. Well, I would even go more extreme when you think yeah. about like what, what is happening now when AI comes into uh, connected TV. I mean, before we can speak with the television, but if you have a, I, I, I try to speak to Siri sometimes, but it's complicated because she doesn't listen to me really. <laughs> so she doesn't understand me. But uh, when you have like casual language being understood by a device, can you imagine in the future you go into your living room and speak to your TV and say, play me action, whatever you mix English, German, your TV will understand you. And suddenly the channel is Albert channel. Yeah, yeah, Albert yeah. one, two, <laughs> yeah, three. Yeah. And the whole content you find, it's not about any more recommendation and search. It's about the TV knows, looks at your face with the camera yeah. and probably identifies yeah. what's your mood. And you look angry and maybe it's a comedy yeah. playing for you. Yeah. Because the TV starts to interact you to entertain it's you. A bit so like the, the news feed in, 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 uh, in uh, Facebook, for example. But yeah. then more extreme even. More like the extreme like yeah. TikTok, where basically TikTok plays one channel, we may see this in television, where the television yeah. really is, becomes your personal entertainer. Yeah. And that's only possible with you know, new technology. And, and AI, I think, will play a fundamental role in that. Yeah, I agree. So maybe we now know what the future of television will look like. Let's <laughs> continue that in a couple of years and see who was right. But let's go back to monetization. And, um, Maybe a question first for you, um, Yannick. Have, because we've just been talking about fast so much, have you ever thought about last, launching a fast channel with one football? Or is that too early? We have, but from a product point of view. So for me, it's more, okay, what's the product? The product is a linear 24-7 uh, content uh, curation. Yeah. And I'm super interested in that, even for on-platform. So if you're on one football, you can actually, because there's a lot of proactivity required on one football, just like it is on, is on YouTube to pick and choose what you want to consume. But actually, if you just have also a lean back uh, experience, just a curated linear feed for content discovery, uh, driving engagement, just dwelling time to increase that, there's absolutely a point for that. And if you have it already available on platform for those purposes, why not distribute and commercialize and mm. monetize also off platform? So. Yes, we are thinking about it, but rather from a product point of view. And then how you distribute and where to put it, different question. But mm -hmm. then certainly off-platform via fast hubs or so is something we do. Okay, consider. so maybe in a year from now we have a one football fast channel. There's all sorts of people in the room who would like to collaborate with you probably on that one. Um, let's go back to monetization because um, the most important thing is, of course, to refinance the investments. So how do you do that at one football? Is that just advertising based? You've mentioned subscriptions as well for some premium content. What's the mixture like there and what's been your experience? So it's a dual revenue stream model, uh, advertising and uh, direct to consumer. I think importantly on the direct to consumer side is, yes, a Sky Sport, a The Zone, a Magenta, they all sell or offer uh, matches uh, on one football but we are not a reseller of their monthly subscription. So what we are selling is uh, single game pay-per-view access, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. meaning I would describe one football as a platform. And by the way, on one football, there's only third party content. So mm -hmm. we are not getting into buying rights and content production. We are just providing access to an audience and try to monetize or in the first place, mm -hmm. reach the audience and monetize. So I would rather describe us as an e-commerce business than a subscription business because if we have sold a pay-per-view second Bundesliga from Sky yesterday, next objective is not to retain and get, the, get into another month when it comes to the subscription, but to sell the next pay-per-view. And the next pay-per-view mm -hmm. could be from uh, a Magenta Sport uh, third Liga uh, the day thereafter. So we really consider us rather as an e-commerce business mm -hmm. because we have hundreds of SKUs that we are selling instead of a subscription business where you have like, okay, a monthly and an annual plan, but it's really more an e-commerce business. I think e-commerce is really an interesting it. topic in that area. And so, of course, the follow-up question would be, we're not tied to really just selling pay-per-view events. I mean, there's all sorts of, for example, merchandising you could be selling with football. I mean, if you're big uh, fans of uh, Bayern Munich team and you could be selling clothing and, um, you know, anything and tickets even to games. Are you doing that or are you looking at selling games, you know, football games, tickets, merchandising? We do, um, but I think what we also see is that connected TV as a transaction device 
is not that greatly adopted yet mm. by the end consumer. Our competitive advantage is really owning the user uh, in their back pocket on their mobile phone because there they are addressable, they are mm -hmm. segmented, we can reach and activate via push notifications and everything. I think one stat that always surprises, like when we talk to Sky and um, in, in other markets like Globo in Brazil and so on, when we say, look, 40% of our pay-per-view sales uh, are generated during the match. These are revenues that those guys would never make. If you go to the subscription sign-up panel and everything, once they are through the funnel, if they make it through the sign-up panel, the game is probably over. So um, mm -hmm. the CTV as a transaction device, it's like in the uh, single point percentages. Mm -hmm. When you look at where the transaction is made, website, mobile, well, It's hard to do transactions CTV. with remote control. We I all mean, know that. Let, uh, trying to enter the Netflix password with your remote control. I mean, let, uh, let's say this way. Like if you pay via Apple Pay or via um, um, Amazon Pay, on the CTV, it's surprisingly frictionless. Mm -hmm. um, like you bought the match, you like um, almost unintentionally at times. But yes, um, like especially the mobile phone is where we interact with the yep. user. And then easier. I transact on the mobile phone, but sure, I can watch on uh, CTV. So the mobile is like the transaction device, and the CTV is the screen for watching the actual event. I think Over it's a strong combination, you know, you're using the, the, the big screen for, for the content and it's, it's and then mobile phone or tablet for uh, for, for the the e commerce. And yeah. absolutely. combination and isn't it? CTV is like a must have of this like it's like all uh, like playing together because C T V is about convenience. Yes, we can say new generation watches everything on mobile and so on, but ultimately it's best screen available and if I'm at home I do prefer the big screen. Uh, yes, if I'm on the road, I'm in the train, and the mobile is anything I have, we have learned to also enjoy this, but um, CTV or big screen is just a must have. The ultimate experience. Over at Liberty, just one question for you, Albert. Um, what are your experiences with e-commerce? I mean, you've been there for a long time in the market, and there's been, you know, you've seen Hypes come and go about this, you know, merchandising with Amazon applications, home shopping, and, and all those things. Revolutions were yeah. all on and I off. I think currently we are looking into some uh, some opportunities again. Uh, I must say, personally, uh, I'm not a big believer in the e-commerce. Uh, I've been working on uh, some uh, red button applications in the past. We even built some uh, niche websites uh, on the TV so platform. So you can buy the dress of the uh, But they have, they have all disappeared. The and and uh, back then, maybe it might have been a bit uh, too clunky. But, you know, services like, uh, you know, home delivery or maybe ticket sales, uh, if they would have been interesting at the time, then they would still exist. Yeah. I think, you know, people for people, it's much easier to, uh, to do it on their mobile phone or, or tablet. Uh, and also, don't forget that uh, if you want to do something on the TV screen, you have to adapt the, the UI UX experience for it, which creates uh, quite a big investment in, uh, in, the, in the build of your, your website. I mean, let, let me Kirk. add something because it's quite interesting what you're saying. I mean, we have around 85 million TVs in the world installed base, so we see a lot of data on our operating system. And when you honestly look at the data, it proves what common sense tells you. Um, even though the industry experts always tell about e-commerce, when we started seeing people were saying, I need Facebook on my connected TV. I said, who the hell wants to read social media messages on a TV? It's text, <laughs> or initially we had newspapers coming on TV, and now the next big wave is, there was time, home automation is on the, on the big screen. Yep. No one does it, zero use. The next one we talk all about is e-commerce, but then we complain at the same time, we don't want to have so much advertising because it's disturbing the user experience with interrupts. But yeah. e-commerce is the same. Yeah. It interrupts the experience. And people forget one thing completely. A TV is a shared device. You just don't want to be disturbed when you go to, the TV, to your TV. You don't want to interact. And when you go back 90 years back in history, when you speak to TV veterans, they tell you we have hundreds of innovations. I said there's not a single one. Because we still do the same than 90 years ago. We watch videos. The only thing that changes, that's color, it. tone, color, that's it. The resolution But we're changes. still watching videos. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't it feel natural. <laughs> so we believe when you also look at data, as long as we need to interact physically with a the remote, there won't, will not be e-commerce. When it's really easy, 
context related and I just say yes or wave my head and the pizza will be delivered, but I can continue watching. Then yeah. it may happen, but before, I think when it forces you to interrupt, it's not going to happen. Maybe the big screen is really there to support you to escape from your real life, to you know, dig into a movie or some story. Great stories are still the main thing, of course, to watch. You forget about the time and you keep watching and then you don't want to be interrupted, right? Do you want to buy this, the dress that this person is wearing here? Press the button, you're interrupted. You, you know, you, you, there's your escapism gone. It, it, will, it will happen if, if you if you don't disturb the experience. So give an example, you show a, a video, you see a new James Bond, you see um, whatever, whether it's a new James Bond has an, an, a nice suit or nice shoes, you can pull it over to your mobile device to follow up later. But it will not happen the m in the moment because it's not a pleasant experience. So I think that the future will be that you connect the systems, the mobile device, you know, your computer, and you can just transfer it to later or to a different device. And I think that's where the potential will be. There's also yeah. another great story about a failure where people were thinking at some stage a couple of years ago, like the next big thing is that the viewer becomes the program director. So you decide about how um, you know, the, the movie's going to continue, who's going to be the murderer. Well, if I decide who's the murderer, I don't need to watch it, because then I know there's the suspense gone. Again, not proper way of thinking about what the consumer really wants. You want to escape. You want to have the experience of not knowing. You want to be surprised. If I know what's happening, I'm not going to be surprised. Mm. So again, there's the mistake in that thought. Anyway, we've got a couple of minutes left, so it's the Q&A part. If you have questions for the panelists, please quickly raise your hand. We've got a microphone waiting for you. Three great panelists. Have we got any questions? Otherwise, it's my job again to continue. And I've um, got a good question for you, I think, to end the um, discussion. Um, we've been talking about a lot about Europe, European players, European markets. You're engaged in Europe, a bit of, of course, international aspect with um, on football. Um, but the big players, of course, are Apple, Amazon, Disney, Netflix. Let's continue with you, Dirk. Do you think that, you know, we're just discussing about something that won't be there in, like, say, five years because the market's going to be completely absorbed by the big gatekeepers at some stage? Well, there's a, when you look at the, the underlying dynamics of TV, I mean, we talk about we sell around 220 million TVs a year, 1.6 billion TVs installed base, 3.5 hours per TV per day viewing time. That's stable. And now everyone wants to grab a new share, but there's no new, new market. We see growth, and so it's a market that will have consolidation. And in any consolidation history, there's only one thing that wins, money. Yeah. So that's... We, we can be sure that the, the market share of Google will increase. And we look, the broadcaster is saying it's about advertising, but who is the largest advertiser in the world? It's not ProSeam or RTL. Mm. It's Google. And the second one is Amazon. And the third one is Meta. So they all want now to get the advertising business in the living room. And so I'm pretty sure we will see a lot of consolidation on the platform side. And then when we think about broadcasting or video streaming, it's not a national game and it's not even a regional game. It's a global. So when we speak to broadcasters, they say, my competitor is ProSieben to RTL or ZDF. I said, no, your competitor is Netflix. And it's global and service. So it means the whole business will go away from regional structure to complete global competition with only very little space for big guys. And I don't see that happening. Uh, uh, but you have it, a different It remains uh, pretty uh, local. You think business yeah. is local and will remain local? Yeah, I advertising business tends to be uh, local. I, I agree with the fact that uh, uh, you know broadcasters are not only competing to other local broadcasters anymore. There's also Netflix and uh, there is definitely uh, Google in the mix uh, and other big platforms like uh, Facebook. Uh, mm. So uh, from that perspective, it's definitely uh, globalizing. But still, the, the majority of the, the, you know, the business as it's been done is, is local. I think also for the, the simple reason that the audience is local. So I agree, but who yeah. has more data about local audience? Set the FRD or Netflix? So the mm. data Netflix owns is so powerful mm. already that they are easily in the position to produce localized content. What do they have done over the last year? So yeah, if, interesting if they use it for advertising, obviously. Yeah, but they also use it a lot for content production. Yeah, and I think it's also easy to replicate, you know, if if it's easy to uh, to use the, the, the viewing behavior to create uh, audience data or, or, or profiles, 
then uh, it's, it should be fairly simple to replicate by, uh, by the traditional broadcasters. True, but when I look at who has deeper pockets, that will be the difficult part. Yeah, that's true. It's Although definitely... I, I, I think sorry, uh, are I ARD and ZDF have deep pockets, pockets or not? <laughs> well, deep pockets, you can look at a national perspective and, yeah, and national look perspective. at a yeah. global perspective. And I think it's a discussion that we can continue um, after the break. Just one more thing, Yannick, for you. You have the last word. Being already a global and international player with one football, do you think that that is kind of reflected by the market development? Will the market become more global, maybe through consolidation, as we've just discussed? I think we touched on two different markets there. Like there's a market of operating systems. Uh, I think the operating system market is super fragmented. Also due to the upgrading cycles, which are just much longer in TV, you had the uh, dongles, the sticks, which made your old TV smart, like from one day to the next, which I think led to all the fragmentation because the OEMs uh, like have just been catching up, but the dongles were those who made a TV smart immediately. So yep. I think on the OS, there will be some consolidation in terms of content and who is capturing disposable income on a local level from the end consumer. There are so many different local tastes, preferences, habits. I mean, it's not really related to connected TV, but if I would tell you that it matters significantly when you send push notifications, whether you want to address an Italian one football user yeah. or a Brazilian one football user, like which time of the day they are consuming content. Like there are so many details and differences on a local level. So I think there is, and this is actually a challenge for us as a global platform. And I think it's a challenge for the big global companies to be competitive locally. I think it's not that easy as it is. Yes, it's always about um, like n winner takes all markets, but I think content is so local that there is a room for local players. So there's still local taste that counts in the end. And if you're in Berlin, you're probably a fan of a different football team than if you live in Munich. Thank you very much to the panelists thank and you. thank you for your time. Thank you. Now let's go on to the next panel. And I'd introduce the title for you, the last panel of the day, before we have the reception at the end of the conference. The panel is called Personalized Content Recommendations on Smart TV and is moderated by Jocelyn from Daytexas. And I'd like to welcome Jocelyn and the panelists. Thank you very much.